it's awesome when we get the chance to sing hymns. I know that when I grew up, that's what we did pretty much every Sunday. <laughs> and about two years ago at Nazarene Bible College, one of the uh, best services that I've ever been in, what they ended up doing was they had everybody pull out the hymnals and they had everybody just start reading a verse of a hymn that spoke to them. And it was just incredible. We went for about, it was about an hour and a half on it. Chapel service was supposed to go for 45 minutes, but nobody would stop. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking of that when we were looking, when we were singing number 625 here a little bit ago. <laughs> and when we were sitting there with what a friend we had in Jesus. And specifically, I was, I was getting emotional when we got to verse 2 of it, where it says, Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And, I don't know. It, it's funny how a lot of times you just go through the motions when it comes to, you know, it's just part of the service, it's part of what you do. But that particular verse I was speaking in my heart this morning, that's, that's where, where I'm at, what I needed to hear. And thank you for leaving us this morning. It's so powerful, so great, and that's why I love them, and I want the church to keep having the hymns. I'm so afraid we're going to lose the hymns, and they're so powerful. I grew up with them, too, and I love them, and I just want other people to share, to share them with other people. Oh, yeah, and last night I saw on Facebook they had a link. They had a big cathedral's reunion down in Texas, and they showed a picture of it. And it was a church that probably had seven or eight thousand people there. And I thought, man, I can't think of any place I would have rather been last night. But I used to run sound for them every time they came to Denver, and they'd come for they'd do three shows. <coughs> it was just incredible, mm -hmm. and and there's something about that kind of a service that that just gets lost. And it'd be awesome if we could get it to where people could see it and appreciate it and, and go, wow. You know, I, I love all the contemporary stuff, but there is value in what's worked for a very long time. And when you can see God moving, and uh, what was credible when we used to run sound for him, a lot of times in a contemporary worship service, people like to run it between 90 to 95 decibels, and people start freaking out when it starts getting louder than that. But when we would run sound for the cathedrals, Oftentimes, my dad would run it, and we'd be running 105 to 110 dB, and the whole crowd standing up and singing right along with him. And to where you, you thought the ceiling was going to start falling down. Just incredible when you see those things happening. But today, what we're going to talk about is, do, you, do people want what you have? And specifically, we're going to look at Colossians 4 verses 2 through 6. So if anybody has their Bibles, that would be, and you're going, oh sure. <laughs> you didn't say we we're going to need to have our Bibles. But I'm going to go ahead and read it here. And what I really like about this particular passage is it talks about how we can reach the lost. And one of my favorite things about Paul's writings is that he's really awesome at laying out a plan and giving us everything that we need to make that plan happen. And let's start by reading that passage in Colossians 2, starting in Colossians 4, starting at verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way that you act towards others. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And the first thing we need to look at there is verse 2, where we need to learn how to devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Everything we need to do needs to start with prayer. A lot of times that seems to be our last resort, but everything's going to go smoother if we start there. And if we try to rely on our own abilities on things, we're going to fail. But when we pray, the biggest thing that we get is we get the Holy Spirit interceding for us. 
and where that's awesome when we're trying to reach the lost is it's not just what we're saying to them, but it's what the Holy Spirit is doing in the background and working on their heart <coughs> and doing all the heavy lifting. <coughs> and where it's also cool is when you're talking to somebody, how all of a sudden God just gives you what you need to say. And a lot of times, God puts something on your heart that is just totally crazy, and you go, what in the world do I, why am I saying that? And then it turns out to be exactly what that one person needs to hear. And if we're not submitting ourselves to God and we're not putting everything to prayer, that's not going to happen. Then he goes on to say that we need to be watchful and thankful. What he's meaning by that is we need to have our eyes open so that we don't miss opportunities. A lot of times God has things for us that we don't even hear it or see it because of the noise going on. And it's easy to get distracted. And, you know, when, when Isaiah comes walking in here looking for something on parking, how it's easy to lose your train of thought. How when you hear car alarms start going off, and in a little bit here we're probably going to start having music start playing from across the street and across the parking lot. But that, that's the way life is when it just seems like there's all kinds of noise and distractions and things. We just need to learn how to focus and see what God wants us to see. And we also need to learn to be thankful when He's doing things for us. And we need to learn how to praise Him for that. And it's one of those things that the more you praise God, the more incredible blessings that he's, He starts pouring out on us. And I don't know how many of you guys, I know you guys look at our Facebook stuff all the time, but I'm constantly posting everything that we've got going on here at the church. And the reason that I do that is to praise God and to be able to just show the gratitude. When we're sitting there and all of a sudden, you know, we're a few weeks ago, when we had 7,500 people here on the church property on one weekend, and you start thinking about that. And you start thinking about today we're taking in 16 new members. And that's after taking in 25 new members back at the end of June. And when we had a baptism service where we baptized 25 people. And last Sunday where we have 48 people respond to the altar call. When you start seeing those things happening, you know that that's God working. And that's where we need to praise His holy name and just know that it's His hand at work. And, and where it's really incredible is, you know, we don't have the huge, awesome, incredible facilities and the program that leaves everybody going, wow, with the cool light show and all the spark of glitter and hype. But that's not what reaches people. What reaches people is when God reaches down and blesses everything that you touch. And the testimony of us as individuals is way more effective than just some big, huge group of 500,000, 2,000 people. That one-on-one -on -one reaching out and showing people Christ's love is what's effective. And what I really like about that particular verse that we're looking at, and then verse 2 there, it lays out a great roadmap that if we just follow that one new verse, we're going to be effective for Christ. It says we need to pray, pay attention, and be thankful. That's about as simple as it gets. Pray, pay attention, and be thankful. When we get down to verse 3 and 4, it says, And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. What that's telling us is that we need to pray for our fellow believers. And God hears our prayers, and He's faithful to answer. And I can tell you, I know when God has, when there are other people who are praying for me, because I can just tell. You can feel it. You know when God's there with you, when He's giving you what you need to say, when you're going into that meeting that you don't want to have, that thing that you're dreading, that thing where you're just, 
you're all tensed up and stressed out about it, and when you know that you have other people praying for you, when you know that you've prayed about it, when you know that you've surrendered it to God, and all of a sudden you have that confidence that comes over you, and you have that peace that comes over you, and you have that unspoken assurance that just, you know what, it's all going to be okay. And earlier this week I had a, a meeting like that, and I was so stressed out and worried about it. And what was amazing was up until five minutes until the meeting started, I was dreading it and wishing I could be anywhere else. And the amazing thing, when you start, when you start off the meeting and you can just tell that God's already done the heavy lifting in the background, it starts with a hug and how's it going, and it's good to see you again. And the conversation doesn't go anywhere where you thought it was going to go. And that's when you know it's a God thing. Because that sort of thing doesn't happen. When we're sitting there in just our own strength, that's where it's, okay, I want to point out this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. You need to do this, and you need to do that. And if you don't, well, I'm going to, all that kind of stuff. As opposed to when we turn things over to God and we can just sit there and, and go, wow, I didn't expect that. And that's when you know that it's God's hand at work. And as we look down in verse 5, it says, Be wise in the way you act towards others. Make the most of every opportunity. We need to realize that we're Christ's ambassadors. And we need to realize that people are watching our lives. And we need to live our lives as a witness to our faith. And if people can't see Christ in our lives, our faith has no value to them. And people are smart. They can tell whether you're real or not. It's one thing to talk about Jesus. It's a totally different thing to show Him. And when God gives us those opportunities to share our faith with people, we can't let it sail by. And a lot of times, it's very easy to sit there and say, you know what, somebody else will take care of this. But when God has put that on your heart, when God's put that person across your path, that person who needs it, we need to slow down and take that opportunity to be that person that reaches out. And it's amazing when God tests us on those little things, and if we're faithful to answer and do what he wants us to do, that's when he gives you something a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger until all of a sudden you go, wow, this is incredible. But on the other side of the point, when we have that opportunity and we just say, no, nah, somebody else can deal with that, then you start noticing, I haven't heard God speaking in my life for a while. And that's the scary thing. Just because of the fact that he realizes whether or not you're going to step up to the plate and be that person who he wants you to be. All that to say, we need to be faithful to do what God has asked us to do. In verse 6, it says, Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you will know, so that you may know how to answer everyone. In other words, we need to pay attention to what we say. And we need to make sure that our conversation is full of grace. We need to make sure that our conversation is full of love, full of compassion, full of mercy, full of understanding. We need to be uplifting when we talk to people. We need to be that person who's encouraging. We need to be that person that when you've got good news, that you're the first person somebody wants to find. Hey, I want to talk to you about this. I have this incredible thing happen. We need to be that person. As opposed to when you're excited, you got something that's really incredible, and it's like, that's the last person I want to share it with because they're going to drag me down. They're going to tell me, yeah, yeah, you had, you had this incredible thing happen, but here are the five things that are wrong with it. And here's why I would have done it differently. And it's where you go, oh, that's not who we want to be. That's who people avoid. You want to be that person that when one of the kids here at the church has something that they're excited about, when they have a cool new thing, when they have, 
when they just got a dog, when they just whatever. We need to be that person who's excited, who gives them a hug, who will stop and listen to them. That's the kind of people that we need to be. And here Paul also says that our conversation needs to be seasoned with salt. And in our world, salt isn't that big of a deal. In fact, it's something that gives us heart attacks. <laughs> but at the time, salt was one of the most important things in their lives. And number one, it was a preservative that kept food from spoiling. That made it important. It brought out the flavor in food. It healed wounds. It was a valuable commodity. And it was even used as a means of exchange. And what Paul was trying to convey here is the idea that we need to be wise, that we need to use discernment, and that we need to be intentional with what we say to people. And I guess what the theme of this whole passage is, is that if we have our focus where it should be, that God will give us everything that we need to succeed, and we'll be effective in reaching people, and He'll give us what we need to say, and He'll give us all those right opportunities. Now, applying this on a personal level, one thing that a lot of you guys probably don't know about me, one of my four undergraduate degrees is in marketing. And uh, in one of my salesmanship classes, they have a five-step plan for how to move people through a sales process. And I think that it can be a very effective tool for how to move people along in their relationship with Christ. Now, what those five steps are, it's AIDCA, attention, interest, desire, conviction, and action. The first step in there is attention. If we don't have somebody's attention, we're never going to reach them. And the best way to get people's attention is to show them love. And if people can see that there's something different about your life, if they want what you have, you're going to be able to get their attention. Now as a church, what are we doing to get people's attention? That's where serving food to the homeless on Tuesday nights. That's where having our mash food distributions are important things. Which, by the way, we're having an extra one this next Friday night yeah, from 5 o'clock to 9 o'clock. We were blessed with another truckload full of food. Uh, so if you guys can promote that, that would be awesome, specifically in schools. <laughs> uh, we also get people's attention with things like the trunk or treat that we had a few weeks ago. We get people's attention by doing stuff like providing playground equipment for schools, by doing things like having this tailgate worship out here. And what's been crazy about the tailgate worship is we're starting to see that there are regular people who keep coming and keep parking here. And when you go to church on Sunday morning, but you've got season tickets, you don't go to church on mornings of football games. And so what are they doing? They're coming here and praising and worshiping with like us. And things that I've seen alongside of it, you know, at that point you go, well, we're not reaching anybody new there. But what's incredible about it that I see is you can see that a lot of times there will be five or six people and to where a few of them are normal churchgoers and they've got their friends. And those are the friends who don't come to church for anything or for any reason. But all of a sudden they'll sit there and have a hot dog and drink a Gatorade and hang out for a half an hour. And there's an opportunity to reach somebody who isn't coming to church for any other reason. That's how we get people's attention. Other things we're getting ready to start doing on November 18th, there's going to be an AA meeting here at the church. It's going to be right here in this room. And my prayer is that it outgrows this room really quickly and moves to the fellowship hall and from the fellowship hall to the sanctuary. Believe it or not, there's not an AA meeting from 83rd to 107th, Van Buren to Peoria. Mm -hmm. And when you start figuring out how big an area that is, I'll bet there's close, probably three quarters of a million people in that east area. And the incredible thing is, there's an opportunity to reach the lost. 
there's an opportunity to reach people who may know Christ as their Savior, but they've turned their back for a long time and to where they're hesitant to ever walk back into a church. But there's our opportunity. That's what we need to do to be able to get people on. Get them here, show them our love, get their attention, and let it go from where it goes. You know, and when we're sitting there two weeks ago where we did have 7,500 people here, you know, when you think about that, you go, how in the world do we have that? Between the parking, the mash food distribution, trunk or treat. And of those, we may only reach a handful. But where it's incredible is when I sit there on Sunday morning and I start looking around the congregation and I go, okay, this person came because of NASH. This person came because of the youth group. This person came because of the VBS program that we had in this summer. And for each one of those things, you see that, okay, there's fruit that comes from working that. The second step that we have is getting people's interest. And we're, as a church, we're doing an incredible job with that first step on how to get people's attention. And we've got the attention of our community, and that is an awesome thing. And when it starts moving from just getting their attention to getting their interest, is when all of a sudden you see somebody comes to one thing, but then they come to a second. And then they say, what does it take to volunteer? And that's where you're going, oh, right. <laughs> Lord, this is where we should be going. And once you get to there, the third step is desire. And, that, and for me, that's the exciting step. That's where they take that step from being a part of one of those secondary outside parachurch activity things to where all of a sudden they come to a worship service, to where somebody comes to a Bible study, to where somebody comes to a new believers class. And you go, all right, I can tell. God's working on them. And that's where somebody goes from looking at it as them, one of them, to being one of us. And that's the exciting part. And that's where you can see God working on their hearts. And one of the things we believe in the Nazarene Church is in a concept called prevenient grace, which is where God He's working on our hearts before we come and know Him to where he's, He starts leaning on our hearts. And that's what's happening in this phase where people are they're starting to warm up to it, starting to come to church, starting to feel more at home. And that's what it's all about. And letting God do that work. Now the fourth step in there is conviction. And this is where all those seeds have been planted and they start to take root. And this is where they start listening to the Holy Spirit. This is where people start realizing that they're sinners, that they need Jesus, that they need to be forgiven, that they need to be saved. And they're coming to that realization that it's time for it to move from something that's in their head to something that's in their heart. And the final step in the process is action. And this is where God closes the deal. And this is where somebody gets to be saved. And as believers, what we need to do is we need to learn to be that person who steps in there for people. And don't be afraid to pray with somebody. Don't be afraid to share your faith. It's one of those things that you go, well, I, I don't know the scriptures back and forth and up and down, and I'm not confident in that. And what if I say the wrong thing? What if I do the wrong thing? All I, it's a very simple formula. Speak to them from your heart. Tell them what God did for you. Share your own testimony. Your own testimony is more powerful than anything. And you'll find that when you need that right thing to say, that God will give it to you. And when you go to pray with somebody, it doesn't have to be some big, long, complicated thing. You don't have to make reference to 30 verses. And God isn't impressed by big, wordy things. If you look at the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus shows us how to pray, it's a paragraph. It doesn't have to be wordy. It's one of those things that 
where we need to do is just get it to a place where we're comfortable being able to say to somebody, do you realize that you're a sinner? Do you realize that you need to be forgiven? Are you sick of carrying around all this garbage? Do you want to be forgiven? There's somebody who can do that. And he did it for me, and I know he will do it for you. He died on the cross for your sins, and his name is Jesus. A simple thing like that, and make it your own. Don't make it some canned thing, some card that you read, some little formula. Speak from your heart. That's what makes it effective. It all boils down to if people can see Jesus in our lives, they're going to want what we have. And when we're given that opportunity, we need to make the most of it. And one thing that's incredible, when Jesus, right before he ascended into heaven, in Acts 1.8 it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We've got the power of the Holy Spirit behind us. This isn't us just trying to do something on our own. And if you want something really good to pray about, pray that God will bring one person into your life that you can introduce to Jesus. And make that, write that person's name down and pray for that person specifically by name. And you'll find it incredible when you pray for that specific person. And it may not happen overnight, but you'll see God starting to warm up to their hearts. You'll see it all start coming together. And one thing that last night blessed my heart more than just about anything with our new Facebook page for the church, we're up to a week ago, we were at 40 people who liked our web page, or liked our Facebook page. It's up to 80. And of those 80 names, there's one of them on there who, who posted, you know, hit the little like button last night, who Dion has been praying for for the last five years. That's been the name on there. And when I saw that like on there, I trained all 79 for that one. And that's the way it cares about that one person, and it may take five years, it may take ten years, but when you see that God's put a burden on your heart, when they see that there's something different, it will bear fruit. It's just we have to wait for God's timing. Well, I'd like to close this with a quick word of prayer. Father God, I just pray that you'd give us all that opportunity to share your love with other people. I pray that people would see you working in and through us. I pray that you would continue the blessings that you're pouring out on our church. I pray that we'd just be open to know what your will is and that we would be obedient to that will and that we would follow you. We just thank you for the price that you paid for us. And help us not to let the picture pass by. And I just pray that you would just continue to have those blessings just pour out and help us to be able to have it be our testimony, the incredible things that you do. And for all the people who are joining our church this morning, I pray that you'd help them to grow in their relationship with you. I thank you for each and every one of them. I just thank you and praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, that's awesome. The first time we have a traditional <laughs> service. <laughs> Now it's Sunday school time. <laughs> Thank you, Ted, for that. This was wonderful. It was. <laughs> they were looking for Dion. The kids were. Is she here yet? Yeah. That's who they were looking for.